Okay, great. So, uh, so my name is Mark Geyer. I'm the executive director for the Center for <clears throat> Quantum and Science Engineering at UCLA, which is a new center that just started uh, oh, a little bit over a year ago, I guess. And uh, I came to UCLA to uh, take the position of directing the center uh, last August. And, uh, and so I've been here for about a year. I, before that, I spent most of my career at uh, first at Hughes Research Laboratories in Malibu, and which then became HRL Laboratories after Hughes was, was bought out and, uh, and started working on, the, really started the first quantum computing programs at, at, at HRL all the way back in 2001 uh, with the first big DARPA program that came in that, that area, the Quantum Information Science and Technology Program. So I've been in this field since the end of 2001, roughly, I guess. I think, as I recall, the kickoff meeting for that meeting uh, for that program was delayed by 9-11. So it started right after that. And so I've been pretty much in this field since then, working mostly on semiconductor quantum dots. And uh, <clears throat> now that I'm here at U UCLA, where I've collaborated with people on and off for many, many years, um, I'm picking up the work that I was doing at HRL, which was focused mostly on modeling and simulation of semiconductor quantum dots. So um, before we get into the lectures, I have one, one thing to... Um, one thing to announce, and that is uh, we're starting a student association that's uh, associated with the center. And, uh, and I'm gonna let one of the organizers of the association say a few words about this and then we'll, then we'll jump into the, uh, into the lecture. So Henry, are you there? Yep, can you guys all hear me? Hello? Yep. Yes, we can hear you. Sounds good. good. Good morning, everyone. Hi, my name is Henry. I'm a fourth year physics and math of computation major here at UCLA. And Mark, myself, and a few other CQSE students have founded this uh, Quantum Computing Student Association, which is an undergraduate and graduate club, which is meant for uh, students who are interested in quantum computing to learn more and to start getting involved in some of the research and some of the stuff that we do in industry in quantum computing. Um, so there are three main kind of ideas that we want to uh, look at in our club and three things that we really want to focus on. And the first one is uh, project design and competing at hackathons and things like this. So this is actually how the club sort of got founded. Um, a group of students from CQSE got together and started discussing different project proposals. Uh, you know, what things can we do with quantum computing? What can we do in these hackathons that are offered by IBM? Uh, to you know, further our understanding of quantum computing with uh, you know with some projects, and this is actually how the club got started. And so, one of the things that we'll be working towards in this QC Student Association is to uh, pick up the necessary knowledge in order to uh, compete in these hackathons and to do our own individual projects. And the second thing is really for those of you who are more new to quantum computing, uh, maybe don't have that much background in quantum uh, quantum physics and stuff like this. And that is a series of tutorials and workshops to get you guys uh, more familiar with the basics of quantum computing so that you can uh, begin to design your own projects. And I think in that sense that uh, this class will be a very good comp or this class will be uh, focusing on the hardware and a lot of different types of qubits and the, the tutorials and the workshops will be focused a lot on software and what to expect on the software side of quantum computing, designing quantum algorithms, um, learning the mathematical foundations of quantum computing. And so these two will complement each other very nicely and give you a good foundation in quantum computing. And the final thing is to get to know more about the research uh, that's going on here at UCLA and also outside of UCLA. Um, so we'll have a series of seminars and journal clubs that, so that we can discuss uh, research with current UCLA faculty and also with among ourselves. And so throughout the, throughout the year, we hope to not only teach you guys some of the basics of quantum computing if you're new, but also if you're very experienced, if you have a lot of background in quantum physics. Uh, we hope to uh, bring you guys along for our projects and so we can start designing cool things with quantum computing and competing in some hackathons. Uh, so our general meetings tentatively are held uh, even weeks on Fridays in the afternoons, but this might change depending on people's availabilities. And our main channel of communication is going to be our Slack channel. And to join that and to get the most up to date information about our meetings, you should contact us at qcucla at gmail.com if you're interested. Um, so thank you guys all. I hope you guys all check this out if you're interested in quantum computing, which you are because you're in this Fiat Lux. And I'll hand it back to Mark. 
Great, thanks a lot, Henry. Um, yeah, one more thing to note, there will be a page going up. Right now, the uh, announcement of the Student Association is on the main page. It's in the news section of, the, uh, of our website. And uh, <clears throat> then uh, pretty soon, probably in a week or two, we'll, we'll, we'll have a separate page. We'll be also posting information about the Student Association um, as, uh, as part of the CQSE uh, web platform. Okay, so let's see, let's... Um, Mark, I don't yeah. think you're full screen. Uh, I, I, I think you're you're not like presenters format, which is fine. We're just seeing like the next slide, um, or Mark, like the... if you if you just clicked on swap displays, we would be able to see the full screen. Oh, sorry. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Great. All right. So. Um, all right. So let me uh, let me start with an introduction to. Uh, to the talk, the uh, so let's see. Are you seeing my cursor move on the screen there? So I can use it as a pointer. Yes. Okay, great. All right. So quantum information science. Um, so this is a field that's drawing from information theory and computer science and quantum mechanics to process information. So uh, as Clarice talked about in the introductory lecture, quantum mechanics emerged in the twenties to describe some very interesting and puzzling behaviors of of uh, a very small particles, uh, you know, elementary constituents of matter and light, basically, and so the um, so that really revolutionized physics and chemistry and led to lots of inventions um, that were based on principles of quantum mechanics. Um, and some of these, some good examples are the transistor and the laser and the GPS positioning. And there's all kinds of other applications too, but those are some of the big ones. So what's really changed over the last uh, 20, 30 years or so, 20 mostly, uh, or 30, is that we have come to understand that information itself really can be manipulated in quantum systems. And so this is really what in quantum information science is all about. So it's not just you know, solving the Schrodinger equation and trying to figure out uh, you know, what, what, what things quantum mechanics are useful for, for, uh, for making you know, devices and, 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 and things like that, but actually for doing information processing itself. And it's the insights that have that have been developed over the last few years um, in that in that aspect of, of quantum mechanics that's led to this sort of whole new field of quantum information science. And so it's a it's it's really a very interesting discipline because it's drawing on the work of you know physicists, chemists, computer science, material science, chemists, engineers, I and mean, there's just a whole bunch of people that you whose expertise are really needed in order to uh, to make this to make this happen. So. Why my why this is not advancing properly? Um, anyway, okay. So let's go over a few key concepts that will be covered in this talk and that are important to understanding um, quantum computing. So this lecture is focused on on quantum computing, not on other aspects of quantum information science that come to play in quantum communication and things like that. So I'll I'll make maybe some passing reference to those things, but that's not the focus. Uh, we're going to be talking most about quantum computing. So it's one of the uh, one of the key concepts that we want to get across is that that of a quantum state, uh, and a quantum state is a mathematical representation of a physical system. This is will be uh, something I can cover quickly because Clarice really talked about this in the first in the first lecture. Then the the second notion going beyond the quantum state is the idea of a qubit, and this is uh, this we will consider the fundamental unit of quantum information, and it's encoded in this physical system. Uh, in a particular way. And it could be something like a polarization state of light, or it could be states of an atom or spin states of an electron, which is the thing that I've spent most of my time working on. Um, and that's really what's gonna, the, the focus of the rest of the lectures are gonna be talking about all the different kinds of qubits. Um, another key concept is entanglement. Uh, this is also something I'll go over quickly. Clarice mentioned this in the first lecture also. It's this relationship between multiple qubits um, that has, uh, that has uh, some very interesting properties, and it's a key property of quantum systems that uh, are responsible for obtaining a quantum advantage in the, in the applications, uh, some of the applications that we'll talk about briefly. Um, a third concept, uh, or additional concept, I guess we're up to number four or so, is, uh, is coherence. Uh, again, I'll talk about this very quickly because Clarice covered this, but it's uh, essential because these quantum states have to be, have to be protected from the environment and kept coherent, and I'll, I'll briefly review the, uh, this, this notion of coherence. 
And then we'll get more into the computing, quantum computing side of things. And we'll say, okay, now that we've defined qubits as some manifestation of a physical system, well, how do we actually do computation with that? And so the first idea is that of quantum gates. Quantum gates are the equivalent of logic gates in a classical computer. And there are quantum analogs for, for the classical operations. You know, the, 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 the standard Boolean operations have these quantum analogs. And I'll talk about those. And then, then quantum circuits also have, uh, it will be the next topic. And quantum circuits are basically just sequences of quantum gates that act on these quantum states to execute an algorithm. So finally, um, I'll spend some time talking about quantum error correction, which is a really, really key idea that uh, in, is, is really the fundamental enabler for doing any kind of really sustained uh, you know, large scale quantum computation. And this is a procedure that allows for correcting errors that arise in quantum states due to interaction with the environment. And I'll, I'll spend just a little bit of time at the end um, of the concepts talking about the idea of fault tolerance. And this is the idea that a single error in the execution of a quantum gate can't spread and corrupt data beyond the qubit that was damaged by executing a faulty gate. Otherwise, otherwise even with quantum error correction, it'd be impossible to correct all of the errors that, would, uh, uh, that, that could be spread through the system. So then well, I'll finish up the lecture by talking about quantum algorithms and their applications. I'm not gonna go into any detail. I'm just gonna talk about some of the key algorithms that have been developed over the past few years. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk about noisy intermediate scale quantum computers, which are the sort of first quantum processors that we're starting to see being deployed now and what they're, what they're good for and what we'll learn from them. And then uh, just quickly summarize with what the long-term prospects are for the, for the whole field. Okay, so in quantum information science, we've already talked about this in the introduction a bit. It's uh, combining information theory and computer science with the laws of quantum mechanics to process information. And uh, so as mentioned already, we've uh, had some high impact technologies um, that have arisen from our standard understanding of quantum mechanics, not quantum information science, but the new, these new insights have already produced some impact technologies. It's actually imp imp impacted, I should say, uh, the GPS systems uh, which depend on extreme precision of, of atomic clocks. So the basic notion here again is quantum information science encompasses quantum computing, communication, sensing, and it's spurring other advances in science and technology uh, as a general as a general field. So let's review some of the things quickly that Clarice talked about the last time. The first is the is the notion of a quantum state, and the uh, quantum state is a mathematical representation of a physical system. Uh, it could be something like the like the uh, uh, the energy levels of an atom, and these quantum states are going to provide the basis for processing quantum information. So quantum states they're represented by vectors in an abstract space that's called a Hilbert space. And I won't I, I just I'm not going to go into any detail about Hilbert spaces because it gets quite mathematical, and I want to keep this at a mostly non mathematical level. But I would like to at least get you familiar with some of these terms. So it's the Hilbert space is the space in which the uh, quantum system is, is operating in which the, and the, the space in which the information is being processed. The quantum state vector determines the probabilities of all the possible outcomes of a set of measurements. Clarice talked about this last week. Uh, quantum systems are fragile. There is a, a measurement almost always disturbs a quantum system in a way that you can't ignore. And, uh, and this fragility uh, influences the design of, of algorithms. Uh, in, in, a, in a very profound sort of way. So I'm not, I'm going to stay away from equations mostly in this talk, but I, but I'm going to use this kind of notation over and over again. So I thought I would, uh, thought I would just, just, just show it here. So again, the, the, the idea here is that these are the two quantum states. I'm, I think in terms of electron spin qubits, because I've been thinking about that for the last 20 years. And so I think about the spin states of an electron. So I think, I think most people who took even high school chemistry and physics know that there's this uh, idea of electron spin. Electron has a spin up and a spin down state. And uh, even you know, just understanding the periodic table actually um, it, it already invokes this idea of the pairing of electron spins. You get two electrons in one state and then electrons pair up, uh, come in pairs in the higher energy levels. So, so, we'll be, uh, so I'll be often using this uh, uh, analogy for the two level quantum mechanics system of an electron that has a spin up and a spin down state. And then this, uh, the, the uh, the quantum state can be represented as a superposition of these up and down states. 
and these these uh, uh, coefficients a and b. These are these these are these are the probability amplitudes that are associated with um, with that particular state. So again, this is I'm not going to say much more about that because Clarice talked about it already. I just wanted to remind you of this notion of, of, of probability and superposition. And if you want to make a mathematical representation of the spin up and spin down, you can think of this as a very simple vector uh, or, or column column matrix, if you will, um, that has a, a one zero and zero one representing the two states. And the things that operate on these states are going to be are going to be matrices. And this this uh, in this kind of representation, you can think about these uh, these matrices as really representing this Hilbert space. Okay, so uh, so what's a quantum bit then? Now that we've defined a quantum state, this is the fundamental unit of quantum quantum information, and as as uh, already mentioned, it's encoded this in a physical system, like I was just talking about the spin. So uh, unless the, unlike a classical bit, each qubit can represent inf information as superposition. So this is just a straight carryover from from quantum states. Nothing, no, nothing really new here, but it's just the focusing in on the idea that we're going to use these states for information processing. So at a particular moment in time, um, you can think of a n classical bits can exist in only one of two to the n possible states. You know, a bit is either up or down, and 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 which ones are up and which ones are down. You know, there's two to the n possibilities for that if there's n bits, and that represents a single number. But this the set of n qubits, because of this superposition principle, it can exist in a superposition of all of these states, and that, that's really one of the key ideas um, for uh, for quantum information processing. And this this capability allows quantum information to be stored and processed in ways that are basically almost impossible to do classically. I I, I say almost impossible because one has to be a little bit careful uh, uh, about getting too carried away with. With, with, with some of these concepts. I mean, superposition is not, not, a, not a unique principle to quantum mechanics. I mean, you can have superpositions of all, of all kinds of classical things. You can have a set of coupled harmonic oscillators, for example, pendula even, to take a really simple example, which I'll actually come back to later. And, uh, and, and you can think of the modes of the, uh, of, of the pendulum as, as, as being fundamental modes, and you can have superposition of those modes. So, so superposition states exist classically all the time. But they don't exist in this this particular way, where you have two to the n uh, 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 states possible. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, by 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 treating these as quantum states, um, you can have n qubits representing these two to the n possible states. That's not possible for classical superpositions. You would need two to the n pendula or oscillators in order to have the same kind of superposition. So that's a bit of a subtle point, but I think it's an important one because it's easy to get carried away and think that everything we're talking about here is brand new. But the, these, some of these principles like superposition are actually are very old and apply to classical systems as well. Um, so finally, multiple qubits can be entangled where the measurement outcome is correlated with the measurement of others. Clar Clarice talked about this last time, so I won't say too much more about that. Um, uh, so entanglement, a brief review of entanglement. Uh, this is an inseparable relationship between multiple qubits. It's a key property of quantum systems and, and generally necessary for obtaining a quantum advantage in the, uh, in the algorithms that people are, 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 are designing. So when multiple quantum systems that are in a superposition are entangled, their measurement outcomes are correlated. So this, this entanglement causes correlations that are, that are completely uh, different than what is possible in a classical system. Um, and again, Clarice, I think, covered this already in the last lecture, so I won't spend a lot of time on this. An entangled quantum system, multiple qubits cannot be described solely by specifying an individual quantum state for each qubit. So, um, and these quantum technologies rely on entanglement in different ways. We, uh, when we have these uh, fragile entangled states, uh, when you can maintain a fragile entangled state, then you can have a computational advantage. And what I'm showing down here at the bottom is just an example of, in the notation that we're using before, example of a, of a very simple entangled state. So now we have, now we have two spins, if we're thinking about this, 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 this uh, qubit as an electron spin, and you can have, uh, and, and, and the, this, the state vector now has the state of both of, the, both of the spins, either up or down. And an entangled state is one in which there's, uh, there, there's a, this particular relationship between um, between two states that can, that one is that one, which is spin up, spin down, the other is spin down, spin up. And, uh, and this, this is actually called, a, there's a name for this, it's called a singlet state. And, uh, and this can be formed very easily actually in quantum dots. And we'll hear about that almost certainly in the lecture next week from, uh, from Jason Petta, who 
is going to be talking about uh, semiconductor quantum dots. So uh, decoherence, another concept that Clar Clarice talked about last week. I'll review this very quickly. Decoherence erodes superposition and entanglement through undesired interactions with the environment. So um, some types of qubits are inherently isolated. Others, you know, you have to be really, really careful with. Um, an example of a very well isolated qubit would be a, would be an atom. An atom, basically, unless it's interacting with light, uh, is uh, is pretty isolated from the environment. Um, on the other hand, these kind of uh, superconducting and semiconducting systems that we are uh, a lot of people are building now those do require carefully engineered materials to maintain coherence. And uh, you know, if you have a high de high decoherence rate, that's that's going to severely limit the length and the complexity of computations that you can do. Um, and that's why it's important to be able to do quantum error correction, which, which I'll be talking about in a few slides. So let me give you a very quick, some, I, I think deco decoherence often comes across as this sort of really mysterious thing. And, uh, but it, it's, actually, it's actually really not. So if we think about, let's, let's take a simple example. Let's say we've got, this is a completely classical example, but it has a very, very simple quantum analog also. So let's say we've let's let, let's say we've got two pendulums, one here, one here. And we start these things off in the same state. We, we we move them back some distance and we let these these things swing, right? Then so we can think about what the angle that these pendulums are making with respect to some particular axis, like the vertical axis, for example. And we can say what is that what is that angle as a function of time? Well, if these pendulums are identical and they're just move they're just swinging back and forth, then that then that relationship that angle. Or in particular, the difference between that angle, which you can call a phase relationship, that's that's, that's not going to change. They're always going to be the same. Now imagine that one of these guys is is remains perfect, but this other pendulum, we we go in and we're just we just change the length of the let's say the length of the pendulum is being modulated somehow, you know, by by in some random fashion. Okay, we're just changing the length of this second pendulum, right? So of course the frequency of that pendulum is related to that length. So as you're jiggling this, the length of this pendulum around, the frequency is changing ever so slightly of this guy. And so now if you think about this, the phase relationship where the angle of this one is with respect to that one, that's gonna to start to deviate, right? That, that phase difference is not gonna be zero anymore because this guy's frequency is getting perturbed. So there's, a, there's an exact analog to this in an electron spin. You, you, can, you can think of put in, having electron spin uh, creating a uh, setting up a situation where these electron spins are processing in a magnetic field, and there's a phase relationship between those between the 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 the, the, the these electrons spinning around that's exactly analogous to what's happening in this pendulum case, and the dephasing or decoherence of electron spins is due to the fact that the magnetic field is maybe not exactly constant; it's fluctuating ever so slightly. Uh, and it's fluctuating ever so slightly for the different electron spins. And that leads to this loss of coherence or loss of phase, a fixed phase relationship between the two qubits. Okay, so um, let's move more towards quantum computing stuff. So we've got the idea of quantum gates, which I mentioned. Quantum gates are the equivalent of logic gates in a classical computer. So uh, let's think for a second about how a classical computer works. So a classical com computer is um, uh, uses basically just the on and off states of current flow through transistors, and those define the classical bits, which are zero or one, right? So, um, so for all the for all the amazing things that the classical computers can do, and all their complexity, and all the seemingly uh, sort of magical uh, powers that they have, they're really based on this very very simple idea of a transistor whose current you can just turn it on and off. So it's a three it's a three terminal device. It's got uh, uh, it's got a, a source and a drain. The electrons flow from one to the other, and there's a gate on the top, and you put a bias on that gate, and at one bias the current flows, and the other bias is, it doesn't flow, and uh, and because you can have the these current flows have very big, uh, you know go from off to very uh, easily measurable on values, it's very easy to threshold the value for that current and have a very, very well-defined on and off state or a zero and one state. Okay, so, so that's, that's, the fundamental, uh, uh, that's the fundamentals of, uh, of, uh, of, of how classical computers operate. So now how do you do algorithms? Well, the algorithms are performed by sequence of operations, which are called gates, and they perform Boolean functions that map the binary input states to a binary output state. So, um, so for those who, I'm no computer scientist, so I just grabbed this from some random place on the internet. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, 
yeah, I mean, I do vaguely remember from years and years ago that there are usually seven gates that people talk about. These, these are these are the seven Boolean gates. There's there's other. I think you can define others if you want, but these are kind of the standard definition of the gates. Um, but you only actually need a smaller set of gates um, in order to do universal computation. Computation. You only need two, as it turns out. Um, and for example, a NAND, the NAND and the NOR gate are sufficient to do any uh, universal classical computation. All right, so that's that's the idea of uh, classical gates in a in a computer. So what 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 are quantum gates and quantum gates and how are they different? Uh, I don't know why that's so fuzzy. Um, so turns out analogous gates can be constructed for um, uh, for qubits, but uh, there's important very important differences. So the first one is the these these quantum gates. These are these these are operations that are imp implemented by a, some physical process that evolves the quantum state for a specific amount of time in order to achieve a specific transformation of that state. So that's really what a quantum gate is all about. It's not, it's, it's preparing a quantum state in a particular, uh, uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a particular state and then applying some physical process that evolves that state and that evolves for a certain amount of time and it transforms that state from one, uh, from one, from, from one state to the next. So going back to this, uh, this simple representation of, let's say a spin up and spin down system, you could, you could imagine preparing some initial state where the probability of B is zero. So there's a ground state that's let's say spin up uh, aligned with a magnetic field. And then you can apply some physical process, which I'm not gonna talk about. And we'll hear about that almost certainly to, uh, next week. Um, but that, uh, that physical process can basically operate on this quantum state and it can take this coefficient A and make it zero and make the coefficient be one. So it flips the up state to the down state. So um, this is, occurs by the application of, uh, of what's called a Hamiltonian. Um, and the time dependent Schrodinger equation can basically be written in the following way. As I said, I'm not gonna do much math in this lecture, but this is basically how the, the quantum state evolves. The, uh, the notion is that you have some, uh, some Hamiltonian, which is some operator that acts on that state you apply it for some particular amount of time t, and it takes the initial state uh, at time zero and it evolves it into some different state. So, so the whole name of the game for executing quantum gates is the control over this Hamiltonian that controls the evolution of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the quantum state or the qubit. So um, this equation that I've written down here um, represents the process that's called a, the, the, uh, that, that's called a unitary evolution of the system. And it's called unitary because uh, it's governed by the underlying time dependent. It's, it is unitary because it's governed by the underlying time dependent Schrodinger equation, which I've, which I've written up here. So a couple of things about unitary transformations. Unitary uh, evolution is so-called norm, norm preserving. So um, uh, this is an idea that Clarice mentioned in the last class that these, prob these probabilities, the sum of the square of these probability, probabilities uh, sums to one. And this is preserved under universe, uh, under uh, under unitary evolution. So, in other words, the starting quantum state has uh, obeys this, and even after the evolution for any amount of time, as long as there's no decoherence, then this still applies uh, later on in the evolution. So that's the, the idea of norm preserving, um, and it's also reversible. So, unlike the classical logic case, you might note in the in the previous slide that the Boolean operations take two inputs and create one output. Okay, in, in, in the, uh, the, way we're, the way we're thinking of these quantum gates or the way they, they work is that, um, is that they're completely reversible. So that means that you don't destroy one of the states. It's not like a two input, one output sort of thing. There's always two outputs uh, for that. And those two outputs are the, are the amplitude associated with the, uh, with the states of the qubit. So the one thing that is true is that there's still only two fundamental gates that you need in order to evolve a quantum state. Uh, and uh, then that's basically a single qubit and what's called a single qubit and a two qubit gate. The single qubit just acts on, a, on one particular qubit. Obviously the two qubit gates operate on, on, uh, on two qubit. And of course you can, have, you can have more complex things than that, but I'm just saying that's, that's fundamentally what's needed in order to do, uh, to do quantum computation. So, okay, so let's go to the idea of a quantum circuit then. So as I've mentioned already, it's just a sequence of gates that are strung together to execute a quantum algorithm. And, um, and there's not a whole lot more to say about that, but I do want to introduce you to a couple of terms that you, that you may hear 
in subsequent lectures, or you may hear in, in even in some of the popular uh, things that you read about this. So um, you'll often see diagrams like this, which I'm not going to ex ex explain. This is actually the quantum circuit for what's called the Shore uh, air correcting code. Um, I'm just showing this as an example. The qubits, the qubits are usually laid out vertically, so you can think of qubit one, two, three, four, five, etc. And uh, and the sequence of gates that comprise the circuit go from left to right. So we think of time, the time evolution, say moving in this direction, and this is the number of uh, of qubits. And so so you know you you have this this notion of these rails, and the the rail each rail is associated with a qubit. And then the actual quantum gates that you execute are represented by interactions between qubits on different rails. So, for for example, this this particular thing is called uh, uh, this particular diagram represents a C, the what's called a C naught gate, and uh, and there's there's a classical analog for the C naught, and there's a, also a quantum C naught gate. And in this particular case, case you'll have say this is qubit four uh, is undergoing C naught with with qubit one, and so. Um, so this is the idea of a quantum circuit and how they're represented. The circuit depth is usually considered to be the longest path that goes from the input, say the preparation at the beginning, uh, to some output uh, moving you know, forward in time along these, these wires, as I mentioned. And then there's an additional term that I wanted to introduce, which is the idea of quantum volume. And this is sometimes used to, to describe the product, basically the product of the number of qubits times the depth. And, uh, and that is, uh, that's often used as a metric for the power of a quantum computer. So you'll, even, you'll, you'll see this in articles about, you know, about the Google uh, quantum supremacy result, for example. They talk about the quantum volume, uh, quantum volume of the circuit. So you can imagine quantum volume obviously you know, can, can, can be increased in two ways. You can add the number of qubits, um, or you can make the circuit depth greater. And in the design of the algorithms, there's actually quite uh, interesting trade-offs between, you know, between the, 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 the potentially the number of qubits and the, and the depth of the circuit. Okay, so let me move to- Mark, uh, Mark I, yeah, yeah. I have a question sure. um, about this uh, quantum volume, because I think it, it's an, it, a new sort of concept. How yeah. is that related to, to, to like the, is it related at all to like the number of gates that you can undergo before the system decoheres at well, all, yeah. or yeah, I mean that's that's that that that's a good question, right? Because you um, obviously you know you can make the circuit depth as long as you want, and if you make it if you make it you know significantly longer than the coherence of the system, right? Then you just have random outputs at the end, right? So um, so I think part of the part of the uh, subtlety here is defining what is it that you actually mean. By the um, you know by the depth of the circuit, and I think that the 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 when people talk about the quantum volume, I believe I mean I'm not an expert on this. I mean this this is not really my area, but I mean from what I've seen in the literature and on my understanding of it is it's it's defined as basically when you go to make your final measurements, basically. So regardless of what coherence you have left, you know, that's at least the definition is when you when you make your final measurements to read out uh, you know read out the the answer if you will of the quantum algorithm. Uh, that's that's that that's that's the depth that they use. How much coherence you may have left at that particular point obviously depends on you know on the physical system and decoherence rates and such for the for the various qubits. Uh, Mark, could I ask my question, please? Sure. Uh, I mean, you said some time ago I mean, about atom being you know this uh, this uh, sort of unique uh, uh, say construct where you can have this uh, say. A qubit of these electrons are stable, but is there a concept such as an isolated atom? I mean, can an isolated atom exist? Yeah, well, um, I mean, of course, and of course, atoms are still interacting with the environment in some fashion, right? And so, right. Um, so, so the um, what, so what you tend to see with the coherence times, for example, of the of, uh, of, of atomic systems and, and, and ions is that the coherence times are extremely long. So the, um, so what you'll, you know, you can, you can have many seconds uh, or even minutes in some cases of coherence time of atomic states or states of an ion because they interact so weakly with the environment. And that's a, and that, and that's, that, that was why, you know, this is, was one of considered one of the most promising systems for, uh, for building a quantum computer at the beginning was be, because these coherence times are so long. But I mean, there's kind of a fundamental trade-off between, between um, how isolated the system is and the ability to 
actually do quantum operations uh, and entanglement and things like that, right? The more isolated you are from the system, the harder it is to get things to couple, right? So, um, so there's so what you typically see in systems that have very long coherence times is that it's actually difficult to actually make this the 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 the, the qubits interact, um, and um, and so uh, whereas you know it's easy to get qubits to interact in other systems where the coherence times are shorter just because there's they interact more easily. So there there there's kind of a there's kind of a trade off between that, and you know each of each of the systems that are being explored from a technological point of view have different you know solutions to that problem i mean the the one that the one that is employed for for the electron spins for example is that <clears throat> you can you can put an electron in in a, in a in a silicon lattice so you can put in a quantum dot or you can make that electron as bound to a say a donor state like a phosphorus donor and uh, and electrons in electrons interact pretty weakly with the in, environment in, in 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 silicon actually the spin orbit coupling is very small, and uh, so you can actually get quite long coherence times for electrons uh, in 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 a system like a, a semiconductor. So a semiconductor quantum dot can store an electron, and that spin state of the electron can can actually last a long time, as long as that electron is not interacting, you know, strongly with anything else around it. And so the way you get them to interact is that you have some kind of electrostatic control where you then allow the confinement of the electrons to leak out and they allow electrons to start interacting with each other. And that electron and that interaction you can turn on and off and that controls the way that they, that, that they interact. So, so every system plays that kind of a game where you have a very sort of isolated idle state for a qubit, which is presumably well protected from the environment. And then you you act on that the, the system in some way in order to force interaction between the qubits, but that interaction is only on for a short period of time, and then you go back to some kind of idle state where the coherence is long again. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions? As long as we're in a pause here. What are the inputs and outputs to a gate, or is there like a different concept when it comes to Quantum gates. Oh no, no, no! I said thank you. So, uh, thanks. Sure. Um, so, um, so I mean, if you take a look at the, the the just the circuit that we're looking at here. So, in this particular case, the input is the is the 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 state of qubit four, let's call it, and the state of qubit one, right? And then there's some, and then some interaction is turned on between these two, and that's what executes this quantum gate. So again, this, this quantum gate represents, as I said a couple of slides ago, there's some physical process that's implementing this gate. You're turning on some kind of physical interaction you know, by the application of this, of this Hamiltonian, and you're turning that on for a specific period of time. So all of that has been abstracted out in this diagram. So the, uh, uh, you know, this is drawn as, this, as, this, as if this gate is sort of occurring instantaneously you know, in time, if you're considering this to be the time axis. But it's really, but you know, there, is a, there is a physical time associated with the interaction that's going on that's that's actually transforming these quantum states and performs the action of the gate that you want. Is that is, is that clear? Okay, and then that changes the state of each of those qubits. Yes, that's right. Okay. That's right. And then you move to the next the next then, then, then the next gate is the interaction between qubit 1 and qubit whatever this one is 6 or so, 6 or 7, right? And again, that's the same sort of thing. You in in, in this in this gap period in this gap here there's basically nothing happening. Presumably, ideally, these qubits are sitting in some kind of idle state where they're interacting very, very minimally with the environment, um, and and they're just doing their own thing. They're not. They're, they're, there's no interaction happening. And then at some other particular time, you say, okay, I want to execute my next gate, and then so that means that takes the 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 the, the state of qubit one and the state of qubit six, and it turns on again some physical interaction between them to for some period amount of some period of time. That executes the particular gate that you want. That it, the 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 jargon for it is it, it performs this rotation in the Hilbert space, the desired rotation in the Hilbert space that you want. That's required by the algorithm. And then again, you you sort of shut everything off. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So yeah. So this is so yeah. All all of the all of the physical processes are you know abstracted out and subsumed in. A, in uh, you know in the in the in these simple diagrams, but this 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 tends to be the way people who think in terms of algorithms you know view the quantum circuits, and they're they're less generally less concerned about you know what's what's actually happening that creates this this particular interaction. <clears throat> 
Okay, so let's see, we've got what, about 15, a little more than 15 minutes? Okay, I think we're in good shape. So quantum error correction. So quantum error correction is really, really key because the, uh, in spite of all the talk about isolated systems and we can isolate uh, and keep decoherence to minimum, the reality is, is that these, uh, the environment is always intruding and causing decoherence. And this is something that, that has to be dealt with. So the um, quantum error correction is a procedure that allows you to correct errors that arise in quantum states due to this interaction with the environment or equivalently faulty, faulty control operations, right? So we're applying these gates, as we said, this is some physical process that is, uh, that's, that's being turned on to interact the qubits. And, that, and, and let's, say you, that, let's say that that Hamiltonian is supposed to be applied for you know, one second, okay? Well, what if it's applied for 1.0001 seconds, right? I mean, it's, you can't turn things on and off to arbitrary precision, right? So all of these things introduce subtle errors, just not due to the interaction with the environment, just because the control is imperfect, okay? So there's sort of two sets of things that need to be considered, the interaction with the environment, as well as these faulty control operations. So in starting to talk about quantum error correction, let's start with classical error correction and think, okay, let's think about how that works, right? So, I mean, this is typically achieved using some kind of redundancy, okay? So <clears throat> the simplest example is, you know, you've got some particular bit and you just, you can just copy that single bit into three identical bits, right? And then at some, at some later point, you can measure all three of those bits. And if all of the, if nothing in the environment has corrupted those classical bits or, if all the control operations on all three of those bits were perfect, then when you measure all three, they'll be the same as they were when you, when you uh, uh, I'm sorry, all three will be the same. You could have changed the value of the bit, but point is if everything is interacted, if everything is acted the same on all three of them, then all three of them will measure the same, right? So that's the, that's the basic idea is just, just, just redundancy. So if one bit does get corrupted, for example, say one bit out of the three is flipped, then a majority vote will still assign a proper value for the bit, right? You just say, oh, two of them were up, one was down. Well, two must be the right answer, right? Um, and so obviously you can, you, can, uh, you can increase the number of, of uh, you can increase the size of the encoding, increase the number of bits. And obviously then the probability that a single bit flip corrupts you goes down, uh, you know, goes down uh, polynomially with the, uh, with the number of, uh, uh, with the number of uh, bits that you're adding into the code, right? So again, a very simple principle, majority vote um, of, uh, of some single qubit or single bit that gets embedded into, into multiple bits. So the, initially the, uh, the, the concept for quantum data is similar. So you can take a single qubit and it can be embedded in a logical qubit that consists of multiple single qubits, okay? So you say, ah, oh, well, all right, this sounds easy, right? Well, not so easy. Um, there's a huge distinction. Um, the first, uh, uh, the, the, one, of, one of the distinctions is that initializing the classical bits of a code is easy because you can just copy their value, right? You just say, oh, this bit was one, so I'll, I'll make two more bits that are one. Um, and uh, decoding and correcting classical bits is easy because you can read the data and you can uh, then reset and continue the computation. All right. So, so why is why so why why what what is the problem? What's the problem for quantum data? Well, the first thing is that you can't copy a quantum state. There's something that's called the no cloning theorem that prevents it. All right, and that, that I'm not going to I don't have time to go into what the no cloning theorem is, but it exists, and it says that you can't simply copy quantum data. And the second thing is that you can't you can't read the data either. Right. Uh, I mean, you can read it, but the measurement collapses the quantum state. And all the entanglement that you have is lost at the point that you do a measurement. So, so this, this, this idea of copying or reading and copying, those fundamental ideas that you would be able to employ in classical error correction, those are out the window for quantum error correction. So that looks, that looks hopeless. And in fact, it did look hopeless up until the early 1990s. And then it was realized that amazingly, actually quite astoundingly, there is a way out of this problem. A single qubit can interact, for, for example, with two other qubits in a known state to create an entangled state with unique properties. This is the first step in the way out of this thing. So for example, here's a quantum state that we've been, been, uh, been, been uh, showing over and over again. 
And um, we can do something very simple, which is to take two other qubits that are initialized in some, some other zero, let's call it a zero state, uh, whatever that physical state may be for the particular type of qubit. And you can just, you can interact through these C-naught gates, um, this qubit with the, uh, with the first qubit and then with the second one. And this creates an entangled state. And you say, well, okay, fine. So what's that good for? Well, the, the, the key insight here is that it's actually possible to determine whether an error has occurred by a suitable measurement um, of, these, uh, of, these, uh, 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 of this system, let's say, and apply a unitary correction that returns the state to what's called the code space without disturbing the uh, protected state itself, okay? So, um, so I'm not saying how that's done. I'm just claiming right now that it's possible. Now, unfortunately, we don't really, we can't really go through the details of this. Um, I'm just introducing the concept. But the way this is done is you inter, uh, you it involves interacting with what are two called what are called ancilla qubits. So for this particular three qubit code, there is an interaction. You can interact this with two ancilla qubits. So in addition to this logical qubit in which you've embedded uh, uh, your single qubit and made this this highly entangled state, you introduce two additional qubits. Those two additional qubits are called the ancilla qubits. Those are interacted with the qubits um, uh, in the log in a, with, with various qubits within the logical qubit. And after that interaction occurs, then a measurement of the ancilla qubits occurs. And uh, so the first thing you might ask is, well, all right, you just told me that if you measure the state of a qubit, you collapse it um, and you lose all of the entanglement information. Um, so, so I, so I could naively say, well, I'm only measuring, I'm only measuring uh, the ancilla qubits, so that's fine. But then you might say, well, wait a minute, aren't these guys, aren't these ancilla qubits entangled with the qubits up here? So it really looks like you're pulling a fast one, and that's 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 where the that's where you really need sort of the math to go through this. But it turns out that these ancilla qubits, they end up in a type of quantum state. It's called a product state that when you measure these state, it doesn't affect the original entangled state. So there's a very, very specific way that these ancilla qubits are, are interacted with the logical qubits, such that when you do the measurement of the, these things, it collapses the state for the ancilla qubits, but it doesn't collapse the, 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 the state of the logical qubit. And more importantly, it also, these measured values indicate what operation needs to be performed on the original qubits to return them to the original state without knowing what that original state is. So we've never, we've never determined what the state of this system is at all. All we've done is we've interacted with these ancilla qubits. We've made in a particular type of way that the measurement of these, these ancilla qubits tells you what operation you need to do on these qubits to return them to the initial state. It just specifies an operation that needs to be done. It doesn't specify what anything about what the value or what the state of these qubits are. And so that's the key insight in, 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 in quantum error correction. And it's really quite a remarkable thing because it's not at all clear a priori that it would be possible to design something that where you could enta entangle additional qubits with the system and be able to extract information from it in some way. But it turns out that that, that is in fact possible. And that is the basic idea of quantum error correction. So one, one last thing I want to say about error correction is that there's also an important concept that the, the operations that encode and decode these, these error syndromes, as they're called, um, they can induce additional errors, right? In other words, these operations um, where we're interacting the ancilla qubit with the logical qubit or the, the physical qubits within the logical qubit, these operations aren't perfect, right? They're, these can have errors, right? So, the, um, so that means that the air correction process itself is faulty, right? And so that again, sounds like you may be in trouble, right? And you're in trouble to some extent, but there's, but you can just, you can just kind of think logically through this without, you know, really doing any math. There's a concept here that, you know, if the errors that are induced by encoding, by the encoding and the decoding gates, they have to be small enough so that the whole procedure doesn't do any more harm than it does good, right? So in other words, the, 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 the benefit that you get from the error correction has to outweigh any, any detriment, detrimental effects due to the fact that the operations that you're uh, employing to do the error correction actually have errors associated with them. So, so, there is a, so if, if all of these gates are very, very noisy, for example, then, and you have this, this relatively uh, you know, weak encoding of only three, three qubits in a single 
logical qubit, you won't get any benefit from executing the quantum error correction circuit because, because there's just too much noise in the gates. However, if you really get the errors down, if, they, if these gate errors get very low, um, then you will see that there's in fact uh, a threshold value for the input uh, errors of these gates that then actually starts to yield a benefit. And so this is, this is an idea of threshold and there's mathematically defined thresholds. There's things called pseudo thresholds that basically um, where you um, actually just really do a simulation of the circuit and you ask it what value um, you know, for, the, uh, for the fidelity of the, of the gates do you actually get uh, an, an advantage. But, but that's, that's, an, that's an important concept and you'll, you'll hear it mentioned a lot if you, if you read the, the literature. So um, last idea is fault tolerance. I'm not gonna talk a lot about this. This isn't a uniquely quantum mechanical thing by any means. Um, fault tolerance is just the idea that the, uh, that the error on one qubit, you can't allow to spread to corrupt the data to all the other qubits. Okay, so this is, this is a little bit similar to what I was just talking about, but, uh, but it's a little bit deeper in the sense that um, we're now talking about how errors would spread through, uh, through, a, through a circuit rather than just the focusing on the error correction uh, circuit itself. So it turns out that there's a very, there's, there's, one, I, there's one way of, uh, of actually illustrating a concept of fault tolerance that's pretty straightforward. And that is the idea that if you have, let's say two logical qubits that have three qubits associated with them, um, and, yeah, and you wanna do some operation on that logical qubit, which means you have to have operations on all the physical qubits, there's the notion of a transversal operation. And that means that an operation on qubit one in logical qubit one uh, is done on only the physical qubit in logical qubit two, only the second qubits interact and, and only the third qubits interact. And so if all the gate operations can be done in this transversal fashion, um, it's, you know, if you, if you actually just stare at this diagram and think about it, you'll see that it's hard uh, that, that, uh, that any gate that corrupts a single data qubit doesn't cause the errors to propagate because you're only ever interacting qubits from uh, particular rails associated with those logical qubits. So this is the notion of fault tolerance. And it seems like this is a great thing and we are off to the races. There is one catch to this though. And that is that transversal gates can be used to perform fault tolerant but not universal quantum computation. This is a little bit of a subtle point. Um, universal quantum computation means the whole set of gates in order to, um, uh, that are required to manipulate you anywhere inside the Hilbert space. You can't do that with all transversal gates. It's, there's a theorem called the Easton Nil theorem that says that you require at least one non-transversal gate. Uh, and and this, this, this actually is a real, this is the bane of the existence uh, of people who are trying to design, you know, already moving ahead to designing quantum architectures because the implementation of this, of the so-called non-transversal gate is actually quite complicated and it adds a lot of overhead to the circuit. And again, it's, it's a, you know, like you could spend a whole lecture just on, on this one, on this one concept, this one topic, but um, suffice it to say that the um, building of truly fault tolerant universal quantum computer is greatly complicated by the fact that there is this one non-transversal gate. And this makes uh, making a truly fault tolerant machine actually quite difficult. Okay, so last few minutes, let me talk about what's out there for algorithms and applications. Um, I think probably everybody's heard of the Shor algorithm. That was the most famous, that was the most famous algorithm. And it was the, uh, one of the first uh, that came out. There was, uh, the, I guess the Deutsch Josa that preceded that. Um, this is used to determine the prime factors of a number. And what's really important about the Shor algorithm is that there's an exponential speed up relative to the best known classical algorithm. Um, and this has huge implications for national security because all of the RSA encryption is based on factoring prime numbers. And you know, arguably this is probably the biggest reason why the, uh, why the field has, uh, has grown so rapidly you know, over the last 20 years or so, it's because this is such an important problem. So the, uh, another algorithm is the Grover algorithm. This is the so-called unstructured database search. There is a, uh, there's a quadratic speed up for this algorithm. Um, there's many, many, many applications for unstructured database searches. Um, but there, the, the reality is that the quadratic speed up is not, is not as compelling as an exponential speed up. So it's not likely that people are gonna knock themselves out to implement Grover algorithms on, on quantum computers. 
I may be wrong about that. There may be specific instances. Uh, but nevertheless, it was an important algorithm because it was a different, you know, a different class of algorithm than the Shore algorithm. And, uh, and, and understanding why the Grover, Grover algorithm has this quadratic speed up has imp impacted people's thinking about other algorithms as well. Uh, in sort of more generally speaking, there's this algorithm called the hidden subgroup algorithm, very mathematical thing. It actually subsumes the Shore algorithm, but it captures other problems besides factoring like discrete logarithms, there's the so-called graph isomorphism problem, shortest vector. There's a bunch of problems that map onto these, uh, this hidden subgroup problem. Um, and, uh, and so that's made it really the sort of most important uh, uh, algorithm in some sense. I mean, you know, I mean basically most quantum algorithm, algorithms that run exponentially faster than classical algorithms, they fall into this category. So what about the, the so-called NP, the non-polynomial uh, NP complete, NP hard problems? Uh, that's actually um, that's actually still an active field of research. Um, so the um, sorry, um, and it's uh, it's uh, sorry. Let me go back go back to this. Um, the most the most of the NP complete problems are believed to be outside the class of problems that even a quantum computer can solve efficiently. But I think there's still I'm not a computer scientist, and maybe someone in the audience is and can say more about this in the question period. But um, I believe that this is still somewhat controversial. So it's, there's a sort of understanding of what class of quantum algorithms, uh, uh, algorithm class for quantum algorithms. And it's believed that the NP problems are outside that. Um, but that may be, uh, but I, I believe this is still, you know, this is still actively being studied. So exponential speed up, it's not the only game in town. Um, and uh, which is which is nice because you know graph isomorphism is great, but it's not going to change the world probably. Um, if you can solve the uh, hidden subgroup problem. On the other hand, um, you know if you think about nature being inherently quantum mechanical, you you know you're automatically led to thinking: shouldn't there be some way that a com quantum computer can simulate quantum mechanical problems, right? And so there's this great quote from Richard Feynman. Nature isn't classical, damn it. If you want to make a simulation of nature, you better make it quantum mechanical. And by golly, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look so easy. And this was, uh, I looked for the date of this. Actually, I couldn't find it in a quick, quick search. Maybe somebody knows. It was in the 1980s sometime, I believe, early 1980s. And, uh, and so it turns out he was absolutely right, as he was right about many other things. Uh, never, Feynman's been dead for a while now, and maybe younger people don't know about it. He's a fascinating, fascinating guy should uh, go, go read his books, they're, they're incredibly uh, entertaining. So it turns out that he was right. There's a whole area called quantum simulation. This refers to simulating physical systems that are governed by the laws of quantum mechanics, which you know basically is everything, right? So, uh, so that's pretty nice. The hardest problems um, you know, that, uh, for these physical systems are, tend to be the ones that involve lots of electrons that interact. Those are the really, really hard computational problems for a classical computer. And this, this encompasses tons of problems in chemistry and biology and material science. Um, the classical simulation techniques, they scale exponentially in the number of electrons, uh, just basically because the many, the many body wave function is very, very hard to represent. And this can be done quite naturally by a quantum computer. And so that's, that's why there's real, real excitement about what quantum algorithms can do for quantum simulation. So uh, last slide, basically. NISC Computing era, so the NISC computing era. So NISC is, stands for Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum, and it loosely refers to processors that do not employ quantum error correction, and and uh, that that's where the noisy aspect comes in, and have you know say less than 100 qubits. So um, so you can say, well, when when is the NISC era? How long do I have to wait? Well, you don't have to wait at all. It's here, believe it or not, and it's been here for the last few years. So who's making this processor? So you, um, so three systems are out there that are um, that are producing most of the results. Uh, so Google has several computers. Their biggest quantum computers are the Sycamore and Bristlecone, uh, with 54 and 72 qubits. Uh, this is the this is the Google. I think this is actually the Sycamore uh, picture of the Sycamore uh, machine. Uh, the, there's the IBM Q. IBM has a whole bunch of machines. The biggest ones are the Q20 Austin. And then just recently, the Q53 that has 53 qubits. This is a picture of that. Um, and then the Rigetti computer, uh, biggest one just started, I think last fall was 28 qubits, the Aspen 7. That's a picture of this one here. 
Uh, all of these are based on semiconductor qubits, uh, sorry, superconducting qubits. Um, I think that uh, those are where all the practical machines are right now. Um, but I think we'll see ion and semiconductor based processors pretty soon. We've got Honeywell working on ion traps, uh, both HRL laboratories where I spent a lot of time and Intel are, fo are focusing on silicon based qubits. And there, I should also mention there's a ton of startup companies that are filling in the niche areas in, in both software and hardware. So, I mean, what can these NIST computers do? I mean, I, I have to be honest and say, from my point of view, they don't really do too much right now. There are some interesting quantum simulation and optimization things being tested. Um, you know, there is this quantum supremacy result that was announced last year by Google. It was for a somewhat trive problem involving random numbers, but nevertheless, it was a really, really important demonstration of what can be done. And uh, I think that, you know, in talks I've heard about this, you know, from, from the old timers in the field, I think they're, they take a, a more nuanced or sanguine view of this, which is that, you know, we're basically going to just, we're going to learn mostly from these machines what, next, what the next steps are to take. So Mark, the, Mark I yeah. have a quick question, if you allow me. So um, if there, there, was, there were no errors when you're doing the, your, your quantum computation, order of magnitude, how many qubits would you need to, to, to simulate all the atoms in the universe? Well, I think, uh, yeah, I don't know what the exact number is. I mean, I think it's less yeah, than 100. I don't know. It's, it's yeah, less yeah, than 100, I think, I think right? I think it's yeah, less I than 100, think... something like that. I mean, that's the, so the, the Hilbert space is big enough, right? But then the question gets to, well, you know, what, what algorithm are you actually doing? When you, what, what does it mean to say I'm simulating all the atoms, right? Um, certainly the, the Hilbert space is yeah. big enough, yeah. Um, okay, so I'm out of time. I guess I'm a little bit over, sorry about that. Um, so let me just put up my last slide and say, um, you know, I think that a fully air corrected, a, a large scale quantum computer with fully air corrected qubits, um, that's what you're going to need to solve the real problems that are intractable on classical computers, which are really good. I mean, don't forget, classical computers are really, really good. You can do amazing things <laughs> on the on the uh, on a big classical computer. So that sets the bar really high for um, you know for 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 the win on the quantum computer. The time scale for this, you know, when are we going to have this kind of machine? It depends on who you ask. You know, you'll hear numbers like five years. I think that's wildly optimistic, frankly. I think ten is probably more realistic. But you know, for the, for the people in this audience who are who are just you know starting out, figuring out what they want to major in and you know what, what's interesting careers, in that sense, this is the perfect time to get involved. You don't want to get involved when it's when when everything's working already. This is the this is the this is the time to be involved. There's so much great science and engineering that's going to be needed to get us to this goal, and uh, and the fascinating thing about to me is the mix of people that you need to do this. There's you need physicists, chemists, chem chemists. Mathematicians, you know, electrical engineers, material science, computer—all all of these different disciplines are going to have a role in uh, in in moving this field forward. And it's not only the different disciplines, but this is also not just an academic exercise. I mean, it's doubtful that any university is going to build a full-scale quantum computer. I mean, look at the complexity of these, you know, machines that I was showing on the previous previous page, right? I mean, this is not a one graduate student project, right? Um, so, um, so I think we're, we're um, you know, there's going to be just fascinating collaborations and, and, and just really, really exciting scientific and engineering collaborations between, uh, between companies and between uh, universities and national labs. And, you know, it's, 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 it's just such an exciting, it's, it's so exciting what's going to happen in the next 10 years. I mean, really, um, this, is, this is the time to get involved. So, so throw your hat in the ring, take some classes on this and get excited about it because this is the future. So great, thank you very much. Uh, one quick acknowledgement, a lot of the material that uh, was taken from this report on key concepts for future quantum information science learners. Uh, Clarice pointed this out to me. It was in the report from an NSF center uh, on, uh, on, on what should be part of the curriculum. And so that was extremely helpful in, uh, you know, for me in putting together the outline for this. I thought it was really well done. Can we clap? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mark, uh, really nice talk. And uh, could I could I just uh, pick your brain on your your opinion about? I mean, there are all these superconducting qubits, uh, the nitrogen vacancies and diamond ion traps and all of those things. But one of the the area that is really catching up now is molecular spin quantum materials. What is your take on 
where that would lead to, or is there a future for that? Yeah, that's a that that's that's a really good question. I mean, I I really don't. Um, <clears throat> um, so I've been in this field for a while now, and I've seen, you know, I the 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 first talks that I went to in 1999, right when I was first starting to get involved with this, the superconducting qubits had coherence times of about oh like 50 picoseconds. <laughs> And, uh, and, and, and when they tried to do, you know, the so-called Robbie oscillation experiment, you got like half an oscillation before anything died. And it looked hopeless, right? Um, <laughs> that there would be, that, 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 that any of these physical systems would be good enough to build a quantum computer. And, uh, and uh, the really interesting comment was made, you know, so, so there, there was a lot of, there's been a lot of talk about, well, which, what's, what's, what's going to be the win, you know, which qubit's going to win? What's, what's going to be the dominant uh, a, a qubit, which qubit is going to work? You know, that, that was the question being posed in the early 2000s. And it turned out the answer was all of them. <laughs> Basically, all of them work. Uh, and mm -hmm. they, they all work to varying degrees and they have strengths and weaknesses. And so um, I, think, I think all of these, I, I shouldn't say all, but I mean, many, many, many of these systems that were proposed, uh, ha have been proposed, they all have potential to, to, uh, you know, to, to, to play a role in building a quantum computer. And so I, I think that in the end, it'll be, we'll see play out the same kinds of things that play out in classical technologies, which is that it's other considerations that end up driving what technology wins in the end. It's not necessarily the, 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 that there's gonna be one particular qubit that, uh, that, that is so good in all different aspects that it's the obvious choice, right? Sure. Um, and that's why I've been a very exciting field of research right now, um, which maybe Jason will talk a little bit about next week, is in hybrid quantum systems. And that is saying, you know, some qubits are really good for, th for some things because they have extremely long coherence times. Other mm -hmm. qubits are good for doing interactions. Other qubits are good for doing long distance communication, for example, transporting quantum information across distances. So, you know, it could be that the, that a, I think what we're gonna need for a fully or, uh, uh, air corrected fault tolerant machine is probably some kind of a solid state type system, but it's gonna be a multi-chip system. You're not gonna put, sure. You're probably you're not going to put a hundred million qubits on a single chip, and so you're going to need some kind of distributed architecture. That means you need some way of transmitting quantum information uh, across either across a big chip or between chips, or maybe even uh, 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 short distances, you know, via optical fiber between processors that sit in different locations. All of these things are may end up playing into what the ultimate architecture is, and so. I, I think it's very it's way too soon to be declaring victory or defeat for any one of these qubit types. But I also ask it because you know I'm an organometallic chemist, and so I I think of say spin orbit coupling and field interactions and things like that. So so if you had to go to something like transition metal complexes, then uh, it is more the electrons feel more of the more of the crystal field than in the spin orbit. I mean, not to say that it doesn't feel it, but then if you go to the lanthanides, you've got exactly the opposite thing. You know, uh, it's, it feels more of the spin orbit than the crystals feel. So uh, as an organometallic or a synthetic chemist, I mean, I can see so many ways that one could tailor and design these materials. So uh, the only reason I'm saying is I think uh, I mean, of course, it's taking off now, but it's uh, hopefully it'll, it'll also be a good component to this whole uh, say, science. Uh, I mean, you're absolutely absolutely right. You know, you need each of these things, but I mean, hopefully, there'll also be more interest in molecular spin quantum materials. Yeah, no, I I, I totally agree. I think that's a fascinating area, and it's. Uh, I mean, what I really hope doesn't happen is that. Um, you know, I, I'm a little bit concerned. This is a this is a more of sociological comment than scientific, but I'm a little concerned that um, that people are saying, well, you know, look, you've got the Google Sycamore or, or Bristlecone computer's got 80 qubits, so basically, you know, we're, it's it's done. Superconducting qubits, you know, that's that's how we're going to build a big quantum. And I I don't I, I'm I don't I think it's too early to say that for sure. I think that, and, and also, yeah, I mean, you have to think of the operating temperatures, right? For the superconducting, you have to go really low, and uh, say, so, so if, you, if you can actually push the temperatures to much higher, uh, say, regime, why not? And uh, 
I mean, you're right. I mean, it'll be a shame if you were to say that it's all done and, you know, we know all the materials. So we still have, uh, I mean, it's my opinion that we have to look at all of these things. Yeah, I think we need to we need to keep the research going in all of these different areas and not let it get crowded out by, you know, by the by the apparent success of one particular technology in the early stages. You know, we're still in the early stages of this, right? And uh, exactly. And so I think we need to. Uh, so it's it's incumbent incumbent on I think the people the, the the whole community to make sure that the government uh, people are aware of the fact that you know we need to keep all of these avenues of research open because. There's still a lot of potential for some of these other kinds of systems. Um, I mean, obviously, I've worked in semiconductor qubits for like 20 years, and I have my strong biases. <laughs> uh, I mean, I know all you know. I know where all the I know where all the bodies are buried for semiconductor qubits. Sure. I, I could tell you a million reasons why they might not work, but on the other hand, I can tell you a lot of reasons why they will work, and that's I'm sure that's true for every technology. Thank you. Mark, there's a question in the chat. Can I read it sure. out loud? So people always talk about how great quantum computing is for parallel computing because it can calculate multiple input states at the same time. But for a certain algorithm, there is usually one correct answer or output. So how exactly is this power of quantum computing being harvested? Well, so um, so I think there there may be some confusion over over the fact that there's one particular output, right? Uh, you know, I, I'm not sure whether that question is referring to the, the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics or, or, or something deeper, but, but I, I think it's, a, yeah, I think they wanted to know about the, the probability. If, if, if you're there, person who asked that, speak up, please. I think it's Louis, but I think they might be referring to, to, to the probabilistic nature of quantum. Yeah, I mean, I think that yeah, this is this is something that I, I mentioned in the question and answer session. I think last week, I, I think I chimed in with this comment. I think we we you need to be careful because because we emphasize this the probabilistic nature of of of, of quantum mechanics as a fundamental sort of principle. I think it, it leads to the it leads to the idea that um, that that there's more randomness than there actually is. <laughs> um, the the the. The, the preparation of a quantum state can be done such that you have absolute certain probability of being in a particular state. Um, I mean, the ground state of a system is the ground state and that's where the system sits. And unless you do anything to it, <clears throat> there's nothing probabilistic about it at all. Uh, if you put an electron in a magnetic field and, and it uh, goes into the state that aligns with the field and you don't touch it, then it's always in that state. There's nothing probabilistic at all about it. What's probabilistic is that when you get into these superpositions, and then yes, yes, you do have probability amplitudes that are associated, um, you know, with the with, with the with the say the up and down components of the of the of a two level system, but the but the the time dependence of those probability amplitudes is completely well prescribed by the time dependent Schrodinger equation. So you can manipulate those probabilities to be anything that you want, and in particular, you can make you can make all of them zero except except one. And so, so that so the, the, there's nothing there's nothing non-deterministic in some sense about the output of a quantum algorithm, and it's because of the fact that you're controlling the uh, you're controlling the quantum gates by these by these specified you know interactions that you're turning on and off, and it's manipulating these probability amplitudes in a very controlled way that gets you you know to the to you know the answer that you want. And so, so in the end, there's nothing, there's nothing really probabilistic about the answer. There's nothing random about the answer. But I, I actually on the flip side, uh, Mark, could you also make it entirely non-deterministic and, and not deterministic at all? And, and maybe that can bring some strengths, which we never realized. Uh, yeah, why, yeah. Why, would we, why would you only want to get a, a an answer that we know at the end what what the answer would be, but we might want to get an answer that we have no intuitive say knowledge of. So so we just let uh, the system be non deterministic and come up with some some new insights. Yeah. Um, yeah. I that's a that's an interesting question. I guess I haven't really thought too much about that. I mean, certainly the the randomness. 
uh, the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics is, is used in some quantum algorithms that are associated with random number generation and things like that. Um, and in fact, that's related to this, the, the, the Google quantum supremacy experiment was in fact related to that. It was, um, was uh, the potential application for that is, is, the, is like circuit verification and stuff where you need to actually have very large sets of, where you need to randomly test components of a system, for example. Um, in terms of the letting the system evolve and getting some answer that's completely sort of unexpected, I, I'm not sure what to think about that. I mean, usually, you know, the algorithm that you're executing is in a quantum computer, you don't necessarily know the answer. I mean, you just, uh, you're trying to find the answer, but the answer is, is well prescribed once you obtain it. That, that was the point that I was trying to make. Yeah, because I'm also looking at from, you know, looking at human beings as, as maybe a quantum computer, like as I'm speaking to you, uh, you don't know what I'm going to say next. And so, so that's a completely uh, sort of an arbitrary or non-deterministic sort of, uh, say, passion that is coming from me. So if you can think of all these ensembles of quantum systems, I, I know I'm just giving uh, this uh, completely, uh, could be entirely wrong, but if you look at it that way, uh, say, I mean, eventually we have evolved to process all of these stimuli and come up with uh, this, the kind of conclusions and the way we talk and all of these things. So why couldn't quantum systems be like that? Say these computers that, you know, uh, the classical, I mean, obviously you've got billions of transistors and you you crank up all sort of uh, calculations and you give still get a determin, deterministic sort of outcome. You know that what you're supposed to get, but you, you arrive at that, that at uh, incredible speeds. But in this case, I mean, how I'm looking at the, the quantum computer is, you know, it's, it's not something like the supercomputer where we still know what we are going to get, but is there some aspect that we should also be pushing that uh, this sort of uh, uh, non-deterministic or uh, I mean, probabilistic kind of action? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, yeah that, 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 that's interesting. I mean, I know that there are people thinking or at least speculating about that. I mean, that's, that's pretty far outside of my area of, of, of expertise. So I don't really have too much to say about it. I just, <clears throat> I think I'll just make, make a more general statement, which is that this field is still in its infancy and, you know, we don't know what's going to come out of it. Um, you know, we don't know what breakthroughs we're going to see in the next 10 or 20 or 50 years where quantum information may be even more powerful than, and more, you know, have sure. more applications than what we're, what we're imagining right now. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Mark, if quantum computers can access things that classical computers cannot, what are we going to do to, to check the result of things output by, by quantum computers? Yeah, that's a really good question. And in fact, there's a whole field that's emerged now called QCVV, which is quantum computing uh, verification and validation. And there's a whole classical uh, field uh, in computer science that addresses that problem as well, even for, for classical machines, right? Um, and so, um, yeah, that, I, 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 I'm not an expert in that area. I guess all I'll say about it is that it's an active field of research and people are struggling with this question of how do you validate uh, the operation of a, of, a, of, a, of a machine where you can't access you know, all of the internal states but I think that, you know, uh, but I think the fact that people have thought about this in the context of classical computing already is going to carry us probably part of the way forward because you have somewhat of a similar situation, not, not the inability to access internal degrees of freedom of a classical computer, but the fact that there's just so many of them that you really can't, right? So there's, <clears throat> so there's a lot of thinking about, about how, to, uh, how to do this kind of uh, validation. One other thing I'll add, which I did, did not put in the slides, I probably should have if I was a little more, bit more thorough. And that is, uh, there, there, is a, there are algorithms for, for doing matrix uh, operations in a, in a quantum computer. And, uh, and so that is something that, um, uh, I think it was Seth Lloyd was the paper from, I don't know, maybe 10-ish years ago, maybe a little bit more than that. And, uh, and so it, it is possible to do linear algebra uh, with a quantum computer in some fashion. 
And I did, the reason I didn't talk about that is because um, you have one real problem with that. And that is how do you, if, if this is all classical data that you're loading in you know, to, these quantum, to this quantum register, right? Then you still have this problem of, there's an, of there being an exponential amount of data that you have to input into the computer, right? So, so until you figure out a way around that bottleneck, that's not really gonna be very useful. And that's, that's, so that's why I didn't talk about it. It's not because I don't like Seth Lloyd. He's a great guy, he's a very entertaining speaker. <laughs> so go hear him talk if he uh, ever comes your way. But, um, but I don't see the practical applications for that because, because how do you, you know, wh wh where's the real advantage? There's, there's some very, very large amount of data, exponentially large amount of data that you can process using these algorithms, but you have to get that data into this system somehow. And that's, that becomes an, an exponentially hard problem just in and of itself. The key to quantum algorithms is that the initial state that you prepare for these quantum systems can be done within a polynomial number of gates, not an exponential number of gates. So in other words, you can create this exponentially large number of states, the, 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 the size of the Hil Hilbert space, without having to do an exponential number of operations. And that's another key aspect of quantum algorithm, which I, I probably should have mentioned because it's really very fundamental. And uh, you know, you, if, it, if it takes you an, if, if, if the initialization of the quantum state takes an exponential amount of time, then you have no, then, you, then, then that doesn't help at all. You, there's no benefit. You might as well look, load that data in a classical computer, right? Um, so, I mean, even though you may have the capacity to store, you know, two to the 100 states, you can't load two to the 100 states into the computer, right? It's just, it's, it would take a nearly infinite amount of time. So um, that's an important aspect of quantum computing, which I, I probably, probably should have mentioned because it is really, really important. Mark, can I ask, um, in your opinion, what is the most important problem that we should be addressing in order to go beyond these noisy intermediate scale quantum computers and make them, you know, really helpful to solve real world problems? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, um, I think it's somewhat technology dependent. So <clears throat> in other words, if you ask the people who are designing the, uh, you know, the, the bristlecone or whatever the next Google, big Google computer is gonna be, they're going to have a different answer than the people who are trying to make the first, you know, semiconductor qubit processors, right? Um, so at some level, there's a, the, you know, the hardware still matters a lot, and um, and the challenges that need to be overcome for any particular, you know, hardware platform are going to be different depending on the technology. So I don't think there's a generic answer to that question. Um, I, I do think that the, um, um, that the engineering aspects are very, very important. And, uh, and, and, and what, we're, what every technology, most, almost every technology is wrestling with right now is how do, you go, how do you go beyond this one, two, three, four qubit system, which is kind of a laboratory experiment. <clears throat> and it's a device that you can make in your own clean room or your own whatever, uh, own laboratory. And you can get it to work, and you've got a room full of electronics surrounding it, and uh, and that provides all of the exquisite control and everything that you need in order to execute these quantum gates, which have to be, you know, which have to be precisely timed, and uh, you know, the uh, actual, you know, the actual Hamiltonian that you're applying to the system has to be very well engineered and controlled. But then you face the challenge of going to, you know, the much, the much, much bigger systems, and so you start looking at these pictures, right? And you start saying, well, okay, that's still only 50 qubits, right? Um, what, if, what if I need 50 million, <laughs> right? And you're, and you're gonna need 50 million for a fully air corrected, fault tolerant quantum computer that's doing a big algorithm, you're gonna need, you're gonna need a million times more qubits than what you're looking at in these pictures, right? So I think if I was thinking about this problem as an, uh, from an engineering standpoint, which I'm not an engineer, I'm a physicist, but I've thought a lot about some of these engineering problems. Um, I think there's a whole, whole space there that needs to be thought about. And again, it's gonna be technology dependent as most, you know, as almost all engineering problems are, it's technology dependent. But I, I, would be thinking, I would be thinking maybe not so much in terms of 
how do we make the fidelity of any one particular qubit better? That's a really important problem. And, uh, but, you know, I think that the problems that they have, you know, with these systems here, you know, the, 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 the coherence times aren't great for these superconducting qubits, but, but they're not bad. I think the main problem that they're encountering, and I'm not an expert on superconducting qubits, but, but I know people who are, <laughs> um, and the problem is crosstalk actually in these systems. So, you know, you have to, there is, these systems are controlled by microwave control. And so you're applying microwave uh, signals, you know, to these qubits. Microwaves have got a pretty long wavelength, at least relative to the size of the devices. So the microwaves, they go everywhere and they interact with basically everything else in the system. And so I think the problem of going even from, you know, even from sycamore to bristlecone, I don't know what the problems are with bristlecone. I've heard second and third hand that there's, that the bristlecone is not performing all that well. Um, don't, don't quote me on that. But um, I think the problem is that even going from 54 to 72, the crosstalk is getting a lot worse. And, and how, do you, how do you engineer out that crosstalk? Is it an architecture? Is there an architecture solution or is there some other clever solution there? So I, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of room on the engineering side to think about you know, how you're gonna get to bigger systems. And I think that is, that is something that really needs to be focused on probably more so than it is right now. Um, you know, as well as the problem of, of course, we'd like to extend the coherence of uh, everybody's favorite qubit by, you know, one or two orders of magnitude if we could. Um, but, you know, that may not be the biggest, that may not be, be the biggest problem. The other, the other thing I would focus on that's more fundamental is, uh, it's not, it's kind of an engineering problem, but not necessarily. And that is just, you know, that is just dealing with noise, uh, environmental noise. I mean, crosstalk due to microwaves is some, in some sense uh, related to that. But uh, you know, semiconductor qubits are bothered by the fact that you have to make you have to make structures that have dielectric layers on top of them so that you can pattern gates and things like that. And those dielectrics are they're they're noisy. They've got they've got fluctuators in them. You know, you know the charge charge moves around. You get, there's you know one over f noise in semiconductor materials or dielectrics has been studied for like 50 years or more at this point. And all of those things interact uh, with the you know when when you interact the semiconductor qubits those 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 interactions cause fluctuations in the in the control that you're trying to to, to to provide, and so you know just just the aspects of mitigating noise at that fundamental at that kind of fundamental level that's a really really important problem. It's mostly for solid state based systems, but I think the ion systems are encountering it too. As soon as they start moving into the micro machine traps, um, you know where they have uh, where again they have they have semiconductor materials or dielectric materials in close proximity, they start to see, you know, noise effects creeping in that they don't have when you're just isolating these ions in the magnetic traps, for example. So, so issues of noise are really, really important. And I think issues of scale up on the engineering side are really important. Those are, those are, the, those are the things that, 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 that need a lot of focus. Thank you. Um, I think we are getting close to the end of our schedule time, no? I don't know what the schedule time is, <laughs> so <laughs> you'll have to tell me. Yeah, um, I, I believe uh, we were supposed to finish at 10.30. Okay, well, yeah, I did. Um, again, thank you uh, for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about this. It was fun putting this together. Um, maybe uh, maybe we'll do it again some other time. I'll keep these slides and maybe work on them a little bit more. Uh, you can always improve things. And uh, I'd appreciate feedback actually on the talk because uh, maybe something that we want to uh, give again in the future in some other form. So uh, appreciate your feedback. Oh, Mark, I mean, uh, I mean, it's, it's an excellent talk, and and uh, yeah, I mean, I would highly encourage you to give this talk uh, whenever you can. It is really good. I liked it a lot. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thanks. Thank you so Mark, much. Before we part, Anna and Mark, can I just share the info about a quantum computing course that is going to, to start this Sunday? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, sorry, I forgot about that. So, let, me, uh, let me stop my sharing yes. here. Ah, how, okay. I think I might <laughs> wait, sorry. So there is, um, this, let's see if the screen works. There is this um, organization called Qubit by Qubit. 
you can see my screen, right? Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. With, the, with the leaflet? Okay. So there's this organization called Qubit by Qubit, um, made up of a bunch of young, enthusiastic quantum engineers, and they are putting together a year-long free quantum computing course that, that starts this Sunday. Um, have a look at that. Uh, I will post in, in our Twitter like the link to this, but this should be extremely exciting. And Anna, that's that's what I wanted to say for 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 today. Go for it. Yeah, well, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you so much, Mark, for a very interesting talk. Um, and next week, we're going to start hearing from uh, experts who are actually working with different qubit systems. So everyone will get to learn um, more about uh, what can specific platforms do and how you can like, physically implement qubits in the lab. So that should be very exciting as well. So thank you, everyone, and hope to see you all next week. Oh, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.